Welcome to Invested in Climate. Protecting the planet and decarbonizing the global economy is the challenge of our time. Never before have so many people rallied around a common cause. We all have a role to play, and the opportunity we face is unprecedented. Invested in Climate aims to help people do more to address climate change through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. I'm your host, Jason Rissman. I co-lead a climate venturing practice at the design firm IDEO, supporting early stage climate founders and organizations. I'm also an investor and startup advisor, and have realized that when it comes to climate action, I'll be a lifelong learner looking for the best ways to have a climate positive impact. If you like what you hear, give us a good rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you found us. Follow us on social, subscribe, and spread the word. Find episodes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. Thanks for joining. I think the hard part for people often is just realize you can do this. This matters. Little things add up to big things. Don't think it's too big for you to affect. It's all of us together now. The question is no longer what is wrong with the way you're doing it. The question is now, we all agree, 1.5 degrees. Let's go for it. Then the question is, how can I help you? That's it, because we all have the same goal. Hi, folks. Today's episode is pretty special. William McDonough has been one of my climate heroes for a long time. He began by pioneering the green architecture field, creating buildings that actually create more energy than they use, clean their own air and water, and create habitats for native wildlife. His book and work on the cradle-to-cradle approach spread the idea that waste equals food, helping spark the circular economy movement. He's won two presidential awards and was recognized by Time Magazine as a hero for the planet, and Fortune ranked him number 24 of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Bill brought his typical sage wisdom and poetry to this conversation, and I bet he will really push your thinking. Here we go. Welcome, Bill McDonough. It's wonderful to be in this conversation with you, and and thank you so much for joining us on Invested in Climate. It's a privilege. Thank you. So you and I have gotten to collaborate recently as advisory board members for the World Economic Forum's uh, Scale 360 Initiative for the Circular Economy, and we've run into each other at events in recent years. But our history actually goes much further back. I'm not sure if you know this, but it was about 1998 or 1999 when I heard you speak for the first time. And I was truly blown away as I heard you talk about buildings that produce energy and purify their own water and air while boosting productivity. It was honestly a formative moment for me in understanding that with smart design and avoiding a scarcity mindset, sustainability doesn't need to be in tension with other goals. So a much belated thank you for that lesson and for the inspiration that's really lasted uh, for two decades now. You're very kind. Thank you. When Time Magazine named you Hero for the Planet, they said your utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that in demonstrable and practical ways is changing the design of the world. So first, what is this unified philosophy? And How is it changing the design of the world? It's really sort of discovering the obvious. And that unified philosophy is sometimes referred to as nature, for example, because it has this element of surprise, but it shouldn't. It's like fractals. When we saw Mandelbrot come out with the mathematics of growth, basically, and it was beautiful, and you start to see that that's, we were so you know, we love looking at trees, and then we never saw the math. There they were. But when they, we saw the math, then everybody went, wow, fractals, and aren't they beautiful? And then we see the growth is something quite beautiful in nature. So you have the physics of the sun shining on the earth. That's E. You have the earth itself, the rock with water, and some carbon floating around. That's M. And so Einstein was dealing with E and M. And then you put them together at the speed of light squared, and you get one hydrogen atom, M, equals the mass energy, E, and welcome to the hydrogen bomb. But then when you look at the Earth, all that chaos touches the Earth's surface, and we get order out of chaos. 
which is life. When you burn the log, it becomes entropy. But where'd the log come from? So that's really why I started thinking about designing buildings like trees. Because this is what happens. This is negative entropy. This is order out of chaos. So, so beautiful. It really is a unified philosophy in the sense that it's honoring the laws of nature itself as best we can, where growth is good. We can have this diversity because life is such a diverse thing. It's so beautiful. And the beauty is really important because Murray Go Man, when he discovered the quark and created complexity theory and chaos theory and the butterfly effect, well, after winning the Nobel Prize, he gave a speech at Stanford. He started out by saying, we've discovered something astonishing in theoretical physics, that the more and more beautiful a mathematical formula begins to appear, the more and more likely it is true. Huh. That all of a sudden there was a mathematics that was incredibly beautiful. and It was the beauty of growth itself. There's something about nature. If you go to a beach covered in pebbles, we all turn into Andy Goldsworthy. You just get on your knees and you start collecting them and you put the big ones here, the flat ones or the red ones or the white ones. You start organizing them as a kid. You put some in your pocket and your mom takes them out. Of course, she does the laundry and all that. But the same with seashells. So beautiful. But if you went to a gravel quarry, you're not going to get on your knees. They'll get shredded. And we don't sit here going, wow, I like this piece of crushed gravel more than that piece of crushed rock, you know? It's not inherently beautiful. So nature has a tough time being ugly. It's quite amazing. It's very beautiful. So for me, that's really what it's, what gives us a unified philosophy is the search for the beautiful. And then that's design. And then we can start to think about how can something that destroys the planet or, you know, makes children sick be a beautiful thing? That's why I'm so excited about what you're doing, because right now we've, we've toxified the climate. So, oh no, it's not very beautiful. Hmm. Thank you for that. And, and as we think about the, the role of nature, you know, back to time's statement that the unified philosophy is changing the design of the world. Is that actually true or is it actually this is nature's design that has always been in play? Well, in, in that sense, I hope that's what it is. I mean, that's what we're looking for. Because I, I think one of the last lines in Cradle to Cradle was, nature doesn't have a design problem. Humans do. I work on this idea that Michael Brown and I sort of manifested together in the late 80s, 90s. And the idea that you'd have biological nutrition and technical nutrition is a fundamental discovery, I think. I was talking to an English professor who said, we're using your book to teach rhetoric in the English department at a major UK university. And I said, really? Yeah. And the faculty was a little upset you're an American, but we use it to study rhetoric and how to make an argument. And we use your writings. And I said, really? Why? He said, because you have this strange way of discovering the obvious. And so you get to the end of the book and you go, well, that was obvious. And then you realize it wasn't obvious at all before you read the book. And then you realize, well, that's rhetoric. That's an argument. It got made, and now your mind's changed, and that's the way it is. You discovered it. It's the way the world works. So I think that's what the writer was talking about, is all of a sudden you go, oh, I see. The first job of an architect is change the way we see. Then we rearrange the furniture. Then we build. I see the world as a regenerative biosphere, things that can go back to the natural world, powered by the sun. And then we have the circular technosphere, I call it. So these are objects of human utility and use. So we call them products as a service, for example. Now that's caught on because it's obvious. And that what you want is the service of a washing machine. You want to be able to wash your clothes. You don't buy it so that you can have this much aluminum, this much steel, this much rubber, this much glass in your kitchen or pantry or somewhere. That's not why you got it. You got it to wash clothes. So. Why wouldn't the washing machine company continue to have access to those materials when you're done? So, and then why would we talk about the life cycle of a washing machine? It's an inanimate object. It's in the technosphere. It's not in the biosphere. So what happens when you get to the end of 
and we say what life that's what we do we talk about life cycle and we have this human projection on an inanimate object and we'll go oh end of life of the washing machine it's not a living thing get over it so we say end of use and that's fun because once you say i have the end of use then the question is what's the next use welcome to the circular economy as you know, I, I work at the design firm IDEO, and so I'm naturally very interested in how you see the role of design. And you've talked about the need for designers to be humble, and yet your work also reflects a rare level of ambition where you take into account the needs of nature, of human health, even of future generations. So how do you see this balance between humility and ambition in design? Well, to design for future generations is inherently humble. You're not just in the moment for your own purposes. You're, you're actually designing for all of us forever. Somebody once asked me, well, how long is all this sustainability stuff going to take? And my answer was, well, it's going to take forever, but that's the point. You know, <laughs> If anybody has trouble with the concept of design humility, just reflect on the fact that it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. And that actually we went to the moon before we put wheels on our luggage. And then it took another 20 years to put four wheels on the luggage, you know? Sometimes we're not that quick. So humility, it's an important idea. Well, you mentioned uh, the question of how long will the sustainability movement last or what will it take? You've been a leader in sustainability for a long time. How have you seen the climate movement in particular evolve and how would you describe the moment that we're in now? Well, I think the crisis is upon us. And I think a lot of us had wished that we could avert some of the horrifying prospects of this. On one hand, we're, we don't want to have been right, but we have to feel a bit chagrined that it was this hard, and still is. And there's still people denying it. It's truly astonishing. But when I won the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development uh, at the White House many years ago, 90s. The press came up after it and said, Mr. Sustainable reminded me of Mr. Natural. They went, Mr. Sustainable, you know, what does it all mean? And I said, I'm not that interested in sustainability. And he said, what? I said, yeah, I mean, what's your relationship to your spouse or partner? If you say sustainable, I say, I'm sorry. That's not that interesting, really. You know, is this maintenance? So what I think sustainability is a great word because it's something we can all use. And it can mean many things. And like politics, all sustainability is local. So it really does help us understand that everyone everywhere has a different frame condition. And so we have to respect that. But at the same time, it's not just maintenance. It's about thriving. To me, it's about growth, but it's good growth. We grow the things we need and want, not the things that destroy. So there's some judgments here. And so I think sustainability for me means things are getting better, not just we're maintaining our state. And so when you look at the context of putting carbon in the atmosphere today, the atmosphere is already overloaded. So one of the great stories I, I heard from someone in the carbon capture business was describing, it's like having a bathtub upstairs that's overflowing. And you see water coming down, and you know your house is about to rot, and your head's getting wet. You go upstairs to check the bathtub, you've got two things you can do. Turn down the tap and pull the drain. And you have to do both, because if you leave the tap running at all, you can't turn it off completely. You really do need to find that place where the drain is balanced with the tap, so it doesn't overflow. And so that's what we have to find now, is that point. So we have to go up and re remove carbon from the atmosphere, we're overloaded. And we have to do massive reduction of carbon emissions, Massive. More than 50% by 2030. I mean, that is huge ambition. And we've got to bring on the renewables full tilt. They're non-carbon source of energy. And we have to do nature-based solutions everywhere all the time because it's got multiple benefits. So you bet. Regenerative agriculture, recovery of ecosystems, mangrove plantings, all of it. And then on the other side, though, we are going to have to remove carbon from the atmosphere through some clever system. Because I think we need about 10 gigatons, from what I'm hearing, more per year of removal than nature itself can do. 
So massive, re massive efficiency, massive increase in renewables, massive restoration of the natural world and its, its inherent systems, and then figure out seriously how to get some of this stuff down and not just throw it in holes in the ground, but actually I'm very excited about the idea of looking at hydrocarbons as hydrogen and carbon, but the carbon durable, not atmospheric. And then they use it for things, graphene, make things with it. And then I'm looking at the renewable power being used to make hydrogen, which is coming. And that get green hydrogen down below $2 a kilo. That would be pretty great. Steel loves hydrogen. And then we can look at all these other systems that might capture the carbon. And then we can use it for various um, purposes, including sequestering it. But it's hardly, it's hard to get a value proposition with that. You can put it in concrete. It's worthy, worthy. You can do polymers with it. You can do graphene with it, things like that, rather than just throw it in a hole in the ground. Bill, I spent some time preparing for this interview, trying to learn about more of your accomplishments. And I have to say, even understanding the range of contributions you've made is, is difficult. You helped spark the movements of sustainable architecture and green chemistry, of cradle to cradle design and the circular economy. You founded numerous companies and nonprofits, advised governments, and have designed beautiful buildings that produce more energy than they consume. I heard you once say that every 10 years, you put down the tools you've been using and pick up new ones. So I'm curious, what tools are you using now? And what do you think will be most helpful in the future? Um, that's it's a, one of my favorite moments in life was being with Walker Evans, the great American photographer. And I had an 8x10 view camera on my shoulder, and he was using an S670 Polaroid. He was older, he was quite small. And um, I said, Mr. Evans, you're the world's greatest large format photographer. What are you doing with an S670? And he said to the effect, well, you know, when I was your age, I could lug around 40 pounds of equipment on my shoulder. And, you know, and I said, I'll carry it for you. He says, no, you don't understand. Then when we got 4x5 and we could, like press cameras, we could, go to the factories when we got Hasselblad's and two and a quarter on rolls, we could go into the factories. When the Leica came along, 35 millimeter silent, we could go on the subways. And, and, and so he said, so here I am, I'm 70 years old and I can do this. And here, portrait of William McDonough by Walker Evans. And I was like, what? And he says, listen, every 10 years, put down your tools. If I was still using an 8x10 view camera and all that chemistry and the rest of it, I would have only had one life. So, you know, you take the new tools and you go make art. So put down your tools. The tools I have right now are the tools of the day. I have, we have science of all kinds. It's quite astonishing. We have satellites, which can help us understand things. We're coming up now with some chips, RFID chips, that don't require power that are quite astonishing because we have cell phones and we can work from wavelengths and start identifying things, where they come from, where can they go next and all that. And very inexpensively, these are coming along. So our tools let us do things that we might not have been able to do without them. I mean, if you take something like Uber, it couldn't exist without GPS and everybody having a smartphone and, you know, payment systems automated and, all that, you need a whole bunch of technologies to converge, you know, and then it happens like that. And at the same time, there's magic in it. Like somebody asked Steve Jobs, apparently, like, why do you think you need to put a camera in a telephone? Who needs a camera in a telephone? You know, we have great little digital cameras now. Why would you bother putting a camera in a phone? Now, can you imagine asking that question today when you look at what we do with our cameras and our phones? His answer was very elegant. He said, well, look at it this way. The best camera in the world is the one you have with you. So, hey, Walker, you had an S670 now. What would he be doing today? I promise you, he'd have an iPhone and he'd be taking pictures. So we have solar now. If we have solar so cheap, it's amazing. That's what we're working with. What, what do we have now? You've said before that uh, commerce is the engine of change, I believe. And I believe you work with a lot of big companies or definitely in gatherings where there's big companies making all sorts of big commitments around climate. I'm curious about your feelings around that movement. Are companies moving in the right direction and what do we need to do to help accelerate that progress? 
I think that the people coming together to work on this is really critical and it's happening and it's exciting to see. As being a bit of a person who likes to look at things upside down and straight up and from the side, I think that one of the concerns I have is that I used to express this as, you know, people who are trying to be less bad are not necessarily being good. They're being bad by definition because that's a human value and less and more are numerical values. So if you're being less bad, that means you're bad by definition, just less so. So the real question becomes, how can I be more good? So I like to put those two together. So we say, and I wrote a book about this, that's the upcycle, is the idea that you would have, let's stop doing the things we don't want, let's start doing the things we do want, put them together on the graph. So the things we don't want, we get rid of, and we go towards zero. But the problem with that isn't so much that we don't want net zero bad, it's that we have to be explicit when we say net zero. We're saying we want to be net zero carbon in the atmosphere, or we want to be net zero bad in our minds. What I like is to be 100% fabulous, because designers, right? So at the same time, I would like to be net zero bad. I also want to be 100% fabulous. And so I think with net zero for the children, I like to talk to children. And we discover the obvious together, because they see it immediately. So if I said to you, child, hey, my goal is zero, and you're making my life difficult because I have to feed and clothe you. Isn't our world tough? What a message of a child. So if I say, you know, I'm going to reduce my carbon emissions by X percent in three years, I'm telling you what I'm not going to do. I am not going to do that. Well, that's like telling a taxi driver, quick, I'm not going to the airport. There's information in it, but it may not get you to the airport. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's more like for the kids, we say, hey, let's be zero bad and 100% fabulous. Like, what fun thing can we do? It makes the world a better place. And then we're going there. We're going to go to renewables and we're going to go to, to this kind of energy, not just we're going to cut our negative emissions. And the, re or the, the emissions, let's call them. The language there is tricky too. But the, the other thing is you have to watch out for the fallacy of offsets because, you know, when you think of offsets, people are saying, well, I'll buy an offset with some renewables somewhere to offset my carbon releases. You have to be very careful of two things. One is what if you are, you're adding renewable power to the mix? That's a great thing to do. But if you're using it and you're saying that makes me net zero, because of what I do release to the environment, then the question becomes, are you saying that if you doubled your carbon emissions and you doubled the renewables, that you'd be net zero, carbon neutral? You just doubled the carbon in the atmosphere. See? So they're not the same thing. That's not carbon, and this is carbon. So that's happening every day. And so we, that's something I concern myself with. And if you get ironic and sad about it, it, it's not fun because can you imagine doing lead emissions offsets for kids in Flint and say, I'm going to go take the lead out of the water in some other city and equal the lead you have? You're, you're going to be lead neutral? I mean, what are you talking about? So these things that have a local condition and a lot of the climate issues are justice issues too. Where is it? How is it affecting people locally? You just can't do it somewhere else and say you're okay. It's a complicated world. Net zero is a good place to start, and everybody can line up on it. So fair play. Let's go faster. I love that. So Bill, this podcast, Invested in Climate, really aims to help people do more to address climate change through five categories of action, work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. You've personally created impact through all five of those areas. And I'm curious, what do you recommend that others do? What are some tangible steps that they can take and make a difference on climate through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and, and activism? I think the hard part for people often is just realize you can do this. This matters. Little things add up to big things. Don't think it's too big for you to affect. It's all of us together now. The question is no longer what is wrong with the way you're doing it. We all agree. 1.5 degrees. Let's go for it. Well, then the question is, how can I help you? That's it, because we all have the same goal. So I think the best thing to do now for everybody is just get very calm and very generous 
and start to say, how can I help you? And then it asks the next question, which is, how can you help me? Because we all share the same goal. And then just tune yourself to it. So everything has consequence. How do I choose food? How do I choose packaging? How do I choose you know, car? Et cetera, et cetera. And just become what I would call moving from a kind of timeful mindlessness that we've had. We're all in a hurry. And we don't want to think about it to a more timeless mindfulness. So think about it. Be mindful. And then all of a sudden, it'll show up in your work. It'll show up in your lifestyle. It'll show up in whatever. But it changes the way you think, too. You, you end up thinking, you know, I'm more interested in people who have lives than people who have lifestyles, for example. It's like, oh, it's about life and other people's lives. So it's not just a style question. It's fundamental. It's nice. And same thing for the work. Do the great work. People love this. And we just got to get everybody in a place where they can afford it and where it can benefit more people. Great. You've also said that design is the first signal of human intention. I read that and it really stuck out for me. Uh, I'm curious, what did you mean by that? And also, what, what's the intention behind the work you've been doing? Well, I make a little portfolio. It's just available on my website and it's on my signature for email. But it's called Waging Peace Through Commerce by Design. And I update it every three months. And I just show the stuff we're doing. But it's waging peace is what it is. It's, it's fierce. You know, it's not a passive act. And you remember, there's a great quote by Churchill, I'm trying to remember, it's something like, success is comprised of going from failure to failure without ever losing your enthusiasm. This is hard. And it's, it's, we've got to be really enthusiastic. So the question is, what's our intention? So when we look around, is it our intention to double glaze the planet? Is it our intention to poison rivers? Is it our intention to destroy ecosystem? And then you, that's the question. And if you intend to do that, well, then we're doing great. But if it wasn't your intention and it wasn't part of your plan, then it's your de facto plan because the thing that's happening because you have no other plan. So as designers, it's our job to get up and say, we posit something else. A principled basis for visioning a future that sets goals based on our values. And then, like Aristotle, we would look at how to create value with science and mathematics and so on. So, Plato was looking at what is ethical, what is moral, what is beautiful, what is ugly. It's the humanities and the arts had an academy. Then, Aristotle, a student, was trying to say, well, if you have those values, then how do you act? So, that's your question about what do we do? And once you look at how you act, then you produce value. So the number and the science comes second. First comes what is good, what is bad. Then comes less and more. So that's why I think it's so exciting to watch all this. And our intention is more good, more to share. A world of abundance instead of limits and greed. Because what we've had with capitalism, as was explained to me by head of a big investment bank, when I said, what is the secret of Wall Street? He said, it's the creation of the perception of scarcity where none exists. Think of that. And so people get greedy and they get in a hurry and all that. When actually you could reverse it and think, what is abundance? You know, it's like, how much, instead of how much can I get for how little I give, the question becomes, how much can we give for all that we get? Oh, it's a different question. So it's uh, generosity and abundance instead of limits and greed. We're, I think, witnessing something really interesting. I mean, there's a mass mobilization of, of human interest and creativity and talent to address the climate crisis. And we see it in, in many different sectors or you know, really across the entire economy. Most of those people don't identify as designers, but they're still signaling their human intention. They're signaling their intention to protect the planet or create a, a more livable future. Is their intention then being turned into design and they're not recognizing or they just don't recognize their, their agency as designers? Or is it just that uh, human intention can move forward in many different ways for some, they see it as design and others, it's, it's actually something else? I think it depends a lot on whether you're a passive or active participant in things. 
because there are passive aggressives and there are active aggressives. The question is, are they negative or positive? Right? So there are a lot of people who think they can help by consuming less. So their intention is to consume less. And that's a noble intention. But it may not necessarily be that creative, per se. They'll wait for something to come along that might be a little bit better and those kinds of things, which is fine. But then you've got other people who take a look at Elon Musk. You know, here's this person who intended, who had an inspiration and intended to make electric car, among other things. Well, I don't think he intended to make electric car. He intended to make the world's best car, as he said. So it turned out it was electric. Isn't that something? So his intention was to create a better automobile which would include its ecological effects and so on, and power, performance, and materials, and so on. But if you look at it, all of us can have an inspiration, like let's do an electric car, or let's do the world's best car, if you have enough bravery. And then, and then you see what happens. It, it becomes an inspiration, then it becomes an intention, then it becomes a, an implementation. And there are a lot of us don't move to implementation, and a lot of that has to involve co-creativity. We're not going to be able to do that alone. And then the implementation begins, and then all of a sudden, you're creating a standard, like we did with the fabrics where they were clean enough to eat. All of a sudden, we had done it, and the water coming out of the factory is clean enough to drink. And it was like, well, you can do it. If it can be done, then it's possible. So now you can talk about standards, and they're voluntary. Nobody has to get Cradle Cradle certified. It's not legally required, but it will be a kind of thing. At the beginning, it's an industrial standard done by really well-meaning people working hard. And so that moves to become policy because then policymakers can go, oh, I like that. Look, it's possible. Let's do that. Let's make it a policy. You got to be careful because if you say just have recycled content in something, but if that means it gets toxified again, I mean, hopefully we won't get a circular economy of toxic things. So that's why I call it safe and circular economy because if we just recirculate something that's toxic, it's worse. The real question is safe and healthy and then keep moving. So that can become then policy which can then, and the EU just announced its big policy, I think yesterday, uh, on uh, circular economy things. I'm very excited about it. It's very serious. And then uh, we worked with China through the 12th and five-year plans on circular economy back when I was working with them. And it's exciting to see the enthusiasm, but it's also very serious. And these are turning into regulations, which they can do after being policy, but it takes about 20 years, which is what this took. So you have to be patient. When I think about a couple of things that really stands out about the work that you've done, and you've been successful in a way that is, is really rare in one, getting ideas to spread um, and from ideas, turning them into movements and systems. And you talked about standards as being part of that. And two, I think that you've progressively zoomed out, that you started with buildings and architecture and then you started looking at the materials going into them and you zoomed out to chemistry. And then you thought about the whole system that those materials flow through and you started thinking about a cradle to cradle and circular economy. Is my understanding right? And, and how do you do that? And what should others be thinking about as they are trying to get new ideas to spread? None of this happens by yourself. You, know, you just open yourself to the creativity and open yourself to wise people and go discover your own obvious. So for me, there were things I really cared about as a kid. I cared about the forest because my grandfather had been a lumberjack. So my summers were spent in the Puget Sound and among the giant trees. So beautiful. And, but my year was spent in Hong Kong where we lived, which was a semi-desert island with no water. We had four hours of water every fourth day during the dry season. So I went from a world of abundance to a world of limits and refugees. And we took care of each other, took care of the refugees. And uh, you shared the water and things like that. But in, you know, Puget Sound, water everywhere. Amazing. So I got to see all that and realize that we're all here to share it and it can be graceful. So that was really meant a lot to me. So I created something called the Forest Partnership pretty early. And we worked with Herman Miller who were taking the rosewood off the Eames chair because it's going extinct. So that was furniture. Here we are saying, you know, this wood, can't do it anymore. And all the purists are going, oh, no, Eames had it in rosewood. It has to be rosewood or it's not a real thing. It's like, wow, 
What a crazy thing. You choose extinction of a beautiful tree, which, you know, is cutting down forests just to get to that tree. As if the only word you know is rosewood or mahogany. The only other word you know is pulp. And when you look at the places where these come from, there can be 250 species of tree in one hectare. And you could lose that for a couple of trees because they, they're going to be on somebody's fancy chair from Michigan. Whoops. It is different. And so I just was following my nose, looking for what is beautiful. That's awesome. Bill, thank you so much. I'm really grateful for the time you've shared today. And as always, this has been inspiring and insightful and uh, really grateful that we've been able to have this time together. Thank you. Is there anything that I should have asked or any other things you would have liked to cover? The only thing I'd say right now is it's time to execute everybody. It's time to do it. And the time for talking about it will never end. But the time to do it is essentially now. So put down your tools, take up the new tools, and go wage peace through commerce by design. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Invested in Climate. Please remember to rate us on Apple, Spotify, or Google. Find show notes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Thanks again.